Good morning. So this month our topic is bearing fruits. So for the last two Sundays, Pastor Heroy discussed about the fruit bearing foundations and also discussed about fruit bearing support and also he discussed about fruit that identify us. So this morning, we will study about acceptable fruit. What then is acceptable fruit? I'll read again the uh, text that uh, we read on the uh, scripture reading. Ephesians 1.13 In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Remember that uh, praise. Also, Ephesians 5 verses uh, 10, 8 to 10. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Another verses. Ephesians, uh, Galatians chapter 5, 22 to 23, which is a very familiar verse to each one of us. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. The first phrase here says, the fruit of the Spirit. It's not fruits of the Spirit. It's singular. Fruit of the Spirit. Okay. We Christians categorize people into two groups. Christians, believers, we categorize them into two, unbeliever and believer, because in the unbeliever world, they don't know about believer and unbeliever. But Christians, we Christians, we categorize them into believer and unbeliever. Under the unbeliever are the subgroups we call moral, in between, and immoral moral in between in immoral moral people as we define it are those who identify as the law abiding citizens of the world they follow every law of the land immoral are the people deliberately violating the law and the in betweens are those who are little good and a little bad depending on the weather so both sides they sometimes follow they sometimes disobey that's the in between but those are all unbelievers all of us came from one of these groups i think every one of us agree with this all of us came from one of these groups before we came to believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's why we call ourselves ourselves believer. Question is, does our moral standing have any bearing to our salvation? The clear answer is no. There's no bearing. For all have sin and fall short of the glory of God. We are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. In the eyes of our living God, we are equal. We are neither moral, in between, or immoral. We are just sinners in the eyes of God. We are sinners doomed to die. For the wages of sin is death. In the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophets were and will be tormented day and night forever and ever. 
So if we are feeling good today about our moral standing, maybe it is time to pinch ourselves and wake up to the truth. Redemption can only be found in Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our good works, our morality has no merit whatsoever. They, they cannot justify us before God the Father and give us access to eternal life or to heaven. We are justified only by God's grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In Jesus alone, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. So, if that is very moment, you've come to realize that even your good works will only lead you to hell, I invite you to believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Believe in Him and abide in Him that you may bear fruit because apart from Jesus, we can do, we cannot do anything. But of course, our message this morning is not for the unbelievers. Our message today is for us, believers, for us who profess to have believed in Jesus Christ and are saved, for us who are supposed to have the Holy Spirit. That's why I emphasize the praise. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians chapter 1 verses uh, 13 to 14. We can learn that after we have heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation and believe in Jesus, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. In short, all believers, or shall I say Christians, have the Holy Spirit. Because when we were saved, we were sealed by the Holy Spirit. Meaning, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And if we have the Holy Spirit, by default, we should have the fruit. Because the Holy Spirit bears fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. However, though having the same Holy Spirit that bears fruit, the fruit of every believer is different from the other. What I mean is, not all believers bear healthy, acceptable fruit. And I believe this is the reason why Jesus categorized Christians into three groups, hot, cold, and lukewarm. If the unbelievers has three subgroups, according to Revelation chapter 3, 15 to 16, believers also has three categories, hot, cold, and lukewarm Christians. But these categories are slightly different from how we might perceive that of the unbelievers. Contrary to our belief that hot equates to Faithful, fervent Christians, and cold means cold or dead Christians. Ryan Havena shed light on this controversial text. He said in his article, Hot, Cold, Lukewarm, that based on his historical context, hot in Revelation chapter 3, 15 to 16, is the soothing hot water flowing from the hot springs in the city of Hierapolis to Laodicea, while cold stands for the refreshing cold water from the city of Colossae to Laodicea. Both hot water and cold water are beneficial to people. Is that correct? When it's cold, we need hot water. When it's hot, we need cold water. So, if we look into the, our geography, so... I'm looking into the map of that because these places are in Turkey. So Hierapolis is on top, and then Laodicea is in the middle, 
while Kulisi at is in the bottom. So he says here that the water that flows from Hierapolis going to Laodicea is hot water because there's a hot spring in Hierapolis, while cold water is coming from Colossi going to Laodicea because there's no source of water in Laodicea itself. So these places, I don't know what's the name of these places right now, currently, but these places are in Turkey. So Turkey is somewhere in Europe. You can see on the map, the Mediterranean, it's beside uh, Greece. Greece, other side is Turkey. Okay. Both hot water and cold water are beneficial to, the pe to people. However, as these two waters travel to the docks to Laodicea, because Laodicea is said to have no natural source of water, hence the import from Colossae and Hierapolis, they lose their hotness and coldness as they gather dirt, because they flow. The water becomes lukewarm and good for nothing when they reach their destination. To make the long argument short, Christians can only be two things, beneficial, which is hot and cold, or useless or lukewarm. So hot and cold, beneficial, and then lukewarm. So there's no such thing as cold, lukewarm, and hot. So the three categories is just actually two, and there is no such thing as dead Christians. No dead Christians. If you are dead, you have to ask yourself. No dead Christians because all who believe in Jesus are alive in him. Though there are a useless Christians which we call lukewarm. So what are we? Are we hot? Are we called lukewarm or lukewarm? And what this has to do with the fruit of the Spirit? I know all of us has uh, eaten a mango or has seen one. I think you eat a dried mango. But uh, have you seen the actual mango itself? Do you know that the fruit of the mango trees in Palawan are useless? They cannot be marketed because they have weevil. This is a pest. In fact, Palawan mangoes are quarantined to prevent the spread of weevil among other mangoes. No one is allowed to take mango out of Palawan. Weevil is a kind of mango pulp disease, which I will not define further because I am not really sure what it is. But if you see the mango, it has a weevil. It's good outside, but if you open it, you can see. So it's good outside, but not good inside. <laughs> My point is, all of us has the Holy Spirit that is guaranteed to bear fruit because we are sealed by the Spirit and the Spirit has a fruit. But not all of us are bearing market acceptable fruit just like the mangoes, as our example. Why is this so? In mango farms around the country, special care are given to every mango tree to ensure its proper growth. Aside from that, when the trees start to produce flowers and buds, farmers take additional steps to protect the buds to make sure the fruits will be disease-free. Some farmers spray insecticides to ward off disease-carrying pests. Some are choosing organic way by burning leaves and grass under the tree or while others are wrapping every fruit by plastic. Those who are paranoid enough might be doing all of the above at the same time, just to protect the mangoes. Do you think the fruit of the Spirit is comparable to the mango fruit? Do you think the care the farmers are giving to mango trees and fruit can be or should be given to the Holy Spirit in us and its fruit? I believe so. I strongly believe so. So the question is, how can we nurture the Holy Spirit in us to ensure its growth? And how can we keep our fruit disease free? Or shall I say, how can we make sure our fruit is acceptable or beneficial? Before we answer these questions, let us remind ourselves what the fruit of the Spirit is. Galatians 5, 
22 to 23 says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. If the fruit of the Spirit is comparable to mango fruit, can love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control also have weevil? I mean, spiritual weevil. Is there a love that is not acceptable? Is there a joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control that is not beneficial? Apparently, yes, there is. Let me bring you to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Luke chapter 6, verses 32 to 34. During his sermon, our Lord said, If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. That is Jesus blatantly questioning our love for our parents, children, brother and sister, friends and everyone who loves us back. What benefit it has for us for even sinners love those who love them if you do good to those who do good to you what benefit is that to you for even sinners do the same that is Jesus questioning our goodness towards those who are good to us are we simply reciprocating goodness and never multiplying because if that is the case we are just like sinners. For even sinners do the same. And again, Jesus said, And if you lend to those from who you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. That is Jesus basically telling us that this kind of love, goodness, and kindness are questionable. What benefit do they bring to us? What benefit do they bring to us? Even this love, goodness, and kindness, we are just at far with unbelievers. This is like Jesus asking us, where is the newness of life in that? Where is the newness of life in that? Because once we are saved, we are new creation. The new self created in the likeness of God, in true holiness and righteousness, where is it? Has the old really passed away? Or it is you still a slave to sin but just being moral? Don't worry, you are not the only one who is feeling well bad right now. I even cringe at the thought of the extent I made myself believe that I have acceptable fruit of the Spirit. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, Jesus did. Jesus did it for us. So what kind of fruit then Jesus is looking from us? What kind of fruit of the Spirit is acceptable unto the Lord? Let us return to the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus told us what? Love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be the sons of the Most High for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish, that others would do to you, do so to them. Can we love our enemies?
Can we do good to those who hate us? Can we bless those who abuse us? Can we exemplify patience, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control when we are in pain? Or when someone hurt the people we love? Can we rejoice like Habakkuk in times of poverty and famine? Can we say with him, Though the fig tree should blossom, should not blossom, nor the fruit be on the vines, the, the produce of the olive fail and fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold and there no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Or sing with David, You have put more joy in my heart that they have done they have when their grain and wine abound. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. <clears throat> Can we stay faithful to our spouses after we've seen the worst of each other? Can we say with all honesty that we still love our spouse after we've seen them turn over size from size small to large or even extra large and can we beware of practicing a righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them can we when we give to the needy Sound no trumpet before us, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Or are we just like Christians in Laodicea? To them, Jesus said, I know your works. You ate neither cold or hot. Would that you were either cold or hot? So, because you are lukewarm in neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel to you, I counsel you to buy from the gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may be clothed yourselves, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Those who I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. I believe none of us wants to remain like a Christian in Laodicea. I believe that the Holy Spirit within us all is interceding for us with groans too deep, too deep for words. Because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So going, going back to the question a while ago, how can we nurture the Holy Spirit in us? How can we keep our fruit disease-free? How can we make sure our fruit is acceptable or beneficial? The Bible has a lot to say about this. But I only took a few because we cannot read the entire Bible in 45 minutes. We need to read the Bible even years. Or months. Okay. This is how we can nurture the Holy Spirit within us. Number one. Let us heed Jesus' call for repentance. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 19. Let us be zealous and repent. Repent means forgiveness, asking forgiveness, in turning away from sin to God. Turning away from sin and turning to God. Not a 360 turn, but only 180 degree. Because if that is 360 degree turn, you will just return, right? In your position. Let us relieve ourselves from sin. So that's number one. 
call for repentance. Let us repent. Number two, let us not, let us not quench the Holy Spirit. What then is quenching the Holy Spirit? Let us not extinguish. That's why we have fire extinguisher, right? Let us not extinguish the Holy Spirit fire in us by despising the manifestation of prophecy. We can see that in 1 Thessalonians 5.19 and what is quenching is explained on the next verse, which is 20. Despising the manifestation of prophecy. What then is prophecy? The hope for the second coming and the life after death. And Jesus is alone is our Savior. So if we despise that, we are quenching the Holy Spirit. So let us not despise the Holy Spirit. That's number two. Number three, let us not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom we are sealed for the day of redemption. So the Holy Spirit is in us. Diba? The Holy Spirit is in us. It is holy. And holiness means hating sin. So meaning every time that we do sin, the Holy Spirit is grieving. Grieving the Holy Spirit means to cause him sorrow by one sin. Instead, let's be filled by the Holy Spirit. So there, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is different from infilling of the Holy Spirit. Indwelling happens the time we receive Christ as our Lord and personal Savior. Infilling is an ongoing activity between Christian and the Holy Spirit. Number four. Galatians 5, 16 to 17. Let us walk by the Spirit that we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do, which is good. The only way to conquer flesh or sin is to yield to the host. Holy Spirit. I think this is always a message. Let's yield to the Holy Spirit. Yield to the Holy Spirit. Walk by the Spirit implies both direction and empowerment. That is making decisions and choices according to the Holy Spirit's guidance in acting with spiritual power that the Spirit supplies. So those are just sample uh, verses in the Bible that shows us how we can be able to nurture the Holy Spirit within us. And this is how we can ensure that the fruit of our spirit is acceptable unto the Lord. These are the verses that says that, our, that the fruit of our spirit is acceptable unto the Lord. Number one, let us guard our way according to the word of God. Psalms 119 verse 9 says, By guarding it, how can, you, how can a young man keep his way pure? The answer is, by guarding it according to your word. We need to study. The Bible says not only to read the Bible. But the Bible said, we need to study, meditate day and night. And of course, not only study, we need to apply the lessons we are getting from the scriptures. Since it is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for the proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Number two. How our spirit, our fruit of the spirit be acceptable unto the Lord. Number two. 
Let us be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Ephesians 5, 1 to 2. Believers are to imitate God's holiness. Because we don't know the physical image of God, so we cannot imitate that. We just need to imitate the holiness of God in all of our conduct. Holiness means separation from sin and separation to God. Let's take sin seriously. It is sin either big or small. So let us be imitators of God in holiness. Number three, let us outdo one another in showing honor in Romans chapter 12 verses 10b. Let us go beyond or do more in showing respect to our neighbors. Number four, let not evil overcome us, but let us overcome evil with good. Romans chapter 12, 21. Overcoming evil with good will ordinarily include acts of kindness toward evildoers. Not just fellow Christians, but also evildoers and unbelievers. Number five. Let us seek the thing that are above, the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Let us set our minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Colossians 3, 1-2 Set your mind on things that are above refers to pursuing deeper knowledge of Christ himself in all that belongs to the living with and for him. This would include seeking first his kingdom as is stated in Matthew 6.33. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Number six. The last one I have. Whatever we do in word or deed, let us do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Colossians 3.17 Whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, do all to the glory of God. Every aspect of every Christian's, Christian's life should honor God. Question is, is our fruit acceptable unto the Lord? So let us ask ourselves about this. Only each one of us can answer for ourselves. No other. It is between us, ourselves, and God. With this, I pray that each one's fruit of the Spirit, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, will be for all goodness and righteousness and truth and are acceptable to the Lord. May the Holy Spirit indwells, which indwells and seals us of salvation will fill us and be on fire in us so we will be walking as children of light. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this topic that uh, we have just discussed, Father. Help us, Lord, to uh, open the eyes of our hearts, Father. Open our minds, Father, on this. We know we already have the Holy Spirit, but help us that this Holy Spirit work in our life so that everything, every service that we have will be acceptable to you. Guide us, Lord, in our walk in you, Lord. Help us to walk 
in the light that you have commanded to us. Guide us, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If the fruit of the Spirit is likened to a mango fruit, we might as well become the mango of Gimaras. Sweet, delicious, and above all,